So the next up will be given by Florentin. Thank you. Um, I will start by thanking the organizers for putting together such a nice program. This was definitely the best NeurIPS uh, submission experience that I've ever had. Uh, so this is great. Um, now, before starting to talk about this, uh, I want to take the time to take a step back and ask this, this question, how can we understand deep learning? Right, and I think there are several answers to this question. And perhaps we can divide the like, stereotypical answers in two, in two um, that correspond to two communities in, in deep learning. Uh, basically, theory and practice. Right, and in practice, we try to design algorithms which improve performance. And this, get, this gives us some sort of empirical understanding for the things that work and the things that don't, what kind of ingredients that we need to develop powerful algorithms. And on the other hand, we have theory, where if I make a very stereotypical characterization of it, um, it tries to prove theorems which predict the performance. Of course, I realize that many works don't neatly fit in these two categories, but I'm just try to paint a simplified picture. And this gives us some sort of theoretical understanding where we understand all the little details. We can prove and calculate everything. And I think we've made a lot of progress these past few years uh, uh, in this direction. But we kind of need both, and we want to connect the two. And I think everyone will agree that these past few years, the gap has been widening between the two. Uh, I think it's rarer and rarer than theory actually impacts practice. And it's also sometimes rare that practice informs theory. Uh, but I think there's something that's missing from this picture. There's a third approach, um, which I'm going to call the like, scientific method, by which I mean we perform experiments to evidence phenomena. Okay, and this gives us a third type of understanding that I'm going to call physical understanding. And I think this is important, just like the other two types of understandings. We really want the three. Uh, but it's been quite underexplored. Uh, there's a well-established theoretical community, but there's not really a, a community around um, this type of work. And to give you an example, I think a, like a good recent example of that has been uh, the discovery of scaling laws. Uh, this is an empirical phenomenon that has been discovered through experiments. And this has led to a lot of works in both theory and practice trying to make use of that. In theory, trying to explain where they come from and derive them. And in practice, this has also had a huge importance uh, in the way we scale up to large models. So I think now is the right time and place to have a discussion about this and what can we do in this, this third important but underexplored direction. Uh, right time because, well, the NeurIPS deadline was yesterday, so now you're in between projects and you're thinking about what you're going to do next. And the right place because Apparently with the youth of the community, so I think we have time to learn new tools and new ways of thinking. So that's, that's a superpower that, that we can use. Um, and if you're interested in like, how can you use experiments in, in your work to uh, help, uh, help get, us, get understanding, I encourage you to talk with experimental physicists and neuroscientists. This has been really instrumental for me in learning about this, this way of doing, because this was not really my, back, my background. Um, and so let's, let's try to build a community around this. Um, with this wonderful team of people, we're organizing a workshop, uh, hopefully at NeurIPS, and if we don't make it, then we'll do it somewhere else. And we would welcome your contributions. You should do it here. <laughs> ah, I would love to do it here. Okay, let's, let's talk. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss about this uh, after I like. Uh, yeah, if you have questions, comments about this. If you disagree with what I've said, uh, please come talk to me. OK, so now let's move on to what I want to talk about. Um, and this, I don't mean to be like the perfect example of what I was talk talking about just before. This is just, like, I'm figuring things out as I go. And this is like the first step in this direction of how we can use experiments, uh, treating deep networks as an object of scientific study. And so this is work with uh, Brice Menard, Gaspar Rochette, Stéphane Malin. And I forgot to say that questions are welcome. Please interrupt me at any time. So I want, I want to ask this question. What does a deep neural network learn? I take my favorite CNN architecture and I train it on ImageNet. 
And then I have this black box that gives me good classification predictions. So what, what has been learned? How can I understand what this is doing? For instance, what are the relevant objects to describe the train network? Of course, if you give me the list of all parameters, I have everything I need to know, but can we find a more compressed representation? Are all the parameters really important? Some sense, what are the features, right? We talk about feature learning all the time, but what, what really are the features? How can we understand what, what they are? And in particular, things that I would like to do would be to measure the dimensionality. Essentially, it's what's the number of effective parameters that I have. Perhaps some parameters are actually not learned and don't really matter. So that's the kind of measure of the size of the network or the complexity of the task of what has been learned. And I also want to compute the similarity between networks. So it's like measuring the size of a network and then the intersection between two networks. Okay, this, if we had tools like this, we could start to explore what has been learned and try to understand it. And there's a major challenge for trying to do this. It's that a function can be encoded in many different ways in a network. So we have lots of symmetries. Permutation symmetry is one, right? The nuance don't come in any order, but there are, there are in fact more symmetries than this. And there's randomness in the initialization and in the training. So that means that there's actually a lot of noise because of the symmetries and, and randomness. There's a lot of noise. And if you try to look at the parameters, it's hard to, to see what's, what's going on here. OK, but let's, let's try still. So here is perhaps the simplest thing I could do. I take VGG and just plot the weights. Okay. So there's eight convolutional layers. And for each, for, at each layer, for each pair of input and output channel, I have a small filter. And here is a subset of them. Okay. Uh, so it's hard to see what this really means. Uh, we see some geometrical patterns. It seems that uh, most of the filters are smooth, especially at the last layer, but we don't really see what's going on here. So let's try to um, compress this to see a little bit clearly. So something we can do is do PCA on these filters. So for every layer, I take all the, band I take all the bundles of filters together and I, I compute the principal directions. And here they are. So the x-axis is the depth. Uh, I'm putting the first layer aside because it always has some sort of different behavior for some reason. Uh, and the y-axis is the rank. So the, the, last, the bottom row here is the top PC, and then as you go up, you get, uh, you get things with lower variance. And what we see is that there's surprisingly like, a lot of geometrical regularity. Okay, we get things like average and edges and things like that, center surround filters. Um, and they are very similar across layers, right, which is, is not something that was perhaps obvious here. And the reason is that the eigenvalues are different, but the eigenvectors are the same. Okay, there's a small trend that the filters tend to be wider um, as we go towards a deeper layer, but, on top, but they look most likely the same. And there are some uh, swaps here between the order that just if the eigenvalues are close, sometimes the, uh, the PC can appear in, in different order. Um, so great, we can do that with, uh, with this network, but we can also do that with other networks and see if they learn the same thing. Okay, so here is the more traditional VGG where you have three by three filters. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see, but even though these filters are not in the same space, it's, the visual correspondence is clear that we're essentially learning the same filters. Um, and we can be even more wild. Let's try with random labels. So here I train my network to fit random labels that have nothing to do with the input images. And I need to train a little bit longer, but eventually I end up learning the same filters. Okay, so it seems that these filters don't even depend on the labels. They're just about statistics of the input. Okay, yes? This is a really cool way of visualizing these filters. So how deep are you going into the network? Uh, so here it's, v it's VGG11, so there's eight convolutional layers, and I'm looking at all of them. So even if you have random labels, like until the uh, last convolutional layer, the filters will essentially... Yeah, yeah. And all the, yeah, uh, all the layers are doing the same thing, which is also perhaps surprising, because the first layer we think are doing something like edge detection. Uh, the last layer is it's not clear, but if you just look at the spatial filters, well, anyway, they can't do much more than detecting edges, and that's, that's what they're doing. Yeah? What's the data set you've been using? Uh, this, was, this was ImageNet, all of this. Okay. Um, and now I'm just showing CIFA 10. Um, there's fewer layers because the images are smaller, but 
and the, the, the filters are a little bit noisier, but we, we see mostly the, the, same, the same thing. Um, VGG on ImageNet, um, I'd say maybe 85%, top five, something like this. Okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, this is definitely non-trivial non performance. Like this is, this is just standard architecture. So basically what we see is that there is universality across layers, filter sizes, tasks, data sets. Um, so I am pretty much convinced that we could find a mathematical description of these filters and derive them from first principles, perhaps uh, considerations of groups or something like that. But this is a very low dimensional view of what's going on, right? Essentially, the fact that we see always the same thing, even with random labels, tells us that there is not much interesting going on here. That's not, that's not where the knowledge of what the network is doing here. Where the knowledge is, is mostly along channels, the way we combine the different channels together. So can we understand what's going on there? And it's much harder to look at the weights along channels because I can't just plot them. Right? The, I, here I'm, I'm, look, I'm using the fact that the, C, the CNN architecture is very structured. I'm, I'm coming to you. I'm just finishing my sentence. Um, and that I have the axes of height and width that are preserved across the architecture. But for the channels, there is no topology and there's no way to, to see these kind of things. Yes? Uh, yeah, yeah, you find the same filters with ResNet as well, yeah. Not really. So when I say they're the same, they're not exactly the same. Just like, like for the different layers here, they're not exactly the same filters. But I mean, this, this is, you see ex the same kind of patterns and there's like one-to-one -one correspondence between them. Yeah. Do you try random data? No, I haven't. Um, so I, I think this, this pretty clearly comes from statistics of natural images. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if you take like Gaussian data, do you see these filters or not? Like what is the simplest data distribution where you see this kind of, of thing? Um, I don't know. Okay, but now let me focus along the weights and on channels. And because it's harder, let's uh, try a little bit to think how we can do that. So here I have two CNNs trained on CIFR 10. Um, and I'm plotting the, I'm just visualizing the weights for the first layer. So each dot is a neuron here, where the neuron is described by a weight vector, and I'm plotting this, this weight vector. And the axes correspond to the input features, which here are the pixels. And I want to see if these two networks, the blue and the red networks, have the same weights or not. Um, and so what we find is that there is usually no correspondence between individual neurons. It's not the case that if I pick a neuron in the blue network, I can find an exact match in the red neuron. But we're, we're still safe because we, there's still correspondence. It's just at a global level, at a statistical level. It's as if this, these neurons were samples from the same distribution. Okay, that's how I want to think about the neurons. Uh, so a way to compare them is to compare statistics. Um, so the mean is usually not very informative, but the covariance of the weights is, uh, is something we can compare. And so we can compare the eigenvalues of the covariance and the eigenvectors of the covariance. This is what I'm showing here. This is the eigenvalues, the two, the blue and the red line overlap, so they have exactly the same spectrum. Um, these, are, these are two networks trained on the same data set, but from different random initializations here. Um, and here are comparisons of the eigenvectors. So I take the eigenvectors for the first network as the x-axis and the eigenvectors for the second network as the y-axis, and I compute the the cosine similarity between all pairs. Um, and what this diagonal tells us here is that there is very high correlation uh, between all of these eigenvectors. So essentially the covariances are the same. Uh, so we could try to do this for layer two. Um, and what we see is a bit surprising. We have the same eigenvalues, so it's, it's not like it's completely different. But we have completely different eigenvectors. Now there is no similarity at all. So why is that? There's, in fact, there's something we're not considering here, is to think about what are the axes when we take the weights uh, of the second layer. These axes are defined by the individual neurons in the first layer, right? because the neuron in the second layer combines outputs from the neurons in the first layer. And so these, these axes in the blue network and the axes in the red network correspond to different neurons. 
So they have no reason to be the same, and so we're really comparing vectors that are defined in different spaces. So that's why, we, that's why we don't see anything. But perhaps we can be a little bit smarter and find a way to still compare them. Uh, and to understand this, I want to take a detour through the activations. Okay, so I, I take a data set uh, of images, x1, x2, etc. And I'm going to feed these images to my two networks. And as a result, I get activations, or like representations. Right, which are computed just by uh, applying the weights of the first layer and then taking the, non, the component-wise nonlinearity signal. Um, and again, what are the axes where these representations are defined? They come from the individual neurons in the first layer. So the, rep the representations are different. But there is a miracle, is that uh, the geometry, so the distances and the angles between the representations are actually the same. And the reason why is that if you look at inner products between 5 of x and 5 of x prime, if you normalize things, they turn out to be an average over the neurons in the first layer. So they are a statistic over the neuron, right? They don't, they don't depend on individual samples. It's just, um, it's just something that depends on the neuron populations. And now, if the blue and the red network have the same neural populations, if the neuron weights are samples from the same distribution, and if the width is large enough, the law of large numbers tells us this these two inner products are going to be the same. Now, what's the only degree of freedom that I have? If I have two representations where the distances and the angles are the same, the only degree of freedom that I have is an orthogonal transform. That's the only transform that's going to preserve all the distances. So this miracle is that even though the neurons are not the same, there's a very strict correspondence between the representations, which is just up to a global rotation. So we can find this rotation, which we call alignment, um, as, for instance, Procrustes analysis, if you've heard of this before, uh, so that the representations become the same. Is that, is that clear? Okay. Um, so now if I go back to my layer two neurons, uh, I can use this alignment that sort of undoes the fact that the first layers are different, and now I can compare things meaningfully. So if I go back to, to this comparison, uh, if I compare the aligned eigenvectors now, I find correlation again. Okay, so I, I find correlation only for the first ranks, so we can wonder whether the, the later ranks are important or not. And it turns out that's not the case. Essentially, it's like uh, the ranks are split between two categories. There is the learned part for the high, large eigenvalues, and then there's the random initialization. There is two ways to see this. One is to compare the spectrum that you get after training with the spectrum at initialization. This is the dotted line here. So this is essentially marchenko pastor just that I, I plot the eigenvalue as a function of rank, so it does a different form. Uh, and we see that essentially only the first eigenvalues have moved, so this is an indication that perhaps this is only where the signal is. Um, and a way to check that is to do PCA on the weights. So I just project the neurons on the top k principal directions as a function of k, and look at what the accuracy of the network that we get. And we see that we quickly reach the top accuracy, so we don't need all of these directions. Uh, so we can indeed treat the rest as if it was random. There's no information for the task here. Sorry, can you repeat yeah. this last step? Like, so you remove the low eigenvalue directions and you see the difference. Yeah, so I have, I have all my neurons. So here it's like I, I take the weights of my neurons and I project them on the first eigenvector here on just this line. Okay, so I, I project the weights to a lower dimensional subspace and then I just evaluate what the accuracy is. So here, here this is a here this is a three-layer network, you, but you can do this with any depth. But uh, you need to be afraid that when you do a deep kind of compression, like already the second layer, then you can just not be concerned. So I'm okay. So I'm I'm going to connect these kind of things with performance in a nicer way later. This is like just sort of an early check. Uh, but. Yeah, also here I'm doing this only just for one layer, right? If you do this for all the layers, you might have propagations of errors. It's, it's not, uh, this is probably not the best way to, to measure this, but does that, does that make sense? Yeah? How do you find the rotation data instead of the um, So I use, it comes from the activation. Sorry, where was, it? Where was this? Uh, here, it's a, there's, there's a, um, a problem called Procrustes analysis is essentially find the best rotation that's going to minimize the distance between the representation. 
and you can solve that in closed form. This is essentially doing an SVD. Um, so that's how I find the alignment, and then I use it for the weights. Okay, I'm not, I'm not important. What's important is I'm not just taking this covariance and trying to align here, because of course you can always align anything onto anything else if they have the same spectrum. I'm using the activations, I'm not cheating. Uh, and then I'm saying that indeed for the second layer, things are the same. Yeah? Oh no, this, the, all the spectra that I showed were of the weights. Yeah, if you look at the spectrum of the activations, there are power law usually one over K uh, at all layers. Okay, so the summary so far is that instead of trying to compare individual neurons, which corresponds to comparing networks up to permutation symmetries, um, I propose that we compare neuron distributions, and this is very much linked to rotation symmetries in the representations. So this is a much bigger symmetry group, and I think it's the correct one, because for many things it doesn't matter in what basis things are expressed, right? SGD doesn't care about the basis that the activations are expressed in. And this is why it's only the neuron distributions that matter, not the individual neurons. And so through this alignment procedure, um, if we compare directly networks, they are essentially expressed in different bases. They are randomly rotated with respect to each other. But if we align them, then we can compare and see similarity. And the central object that emerges out of this for theoretical studies, I think, is the geometry that's defined by the activation. So in other words, the kernel. This is the thing that does not depend on this choice of rotation. And so this is, like, if, you're, if you're interested in doing theory, I think this is the object that we should focus on. OK, so let's, let's apply this um, to like, my VGG networks trained on ImageNet and see what, what, can we, what kind of things we see. So to start, I'm just going to change the random initialization. So I'm comparing for each of the convolutional layers, the eight convolutional layers here. Um, the ways learned by these two networks. Um, and these arrows here on the axis, they are measures of the relevant dimensionality for the layer. So this is essentially the, the size of the learned component. Remember that the late ranks seem to be mostly noise and not very important. So we can, we can define some measure of dimensionality that, that the choice is not very important. And then we can compare whether we get correlation up to that dimensionality or not. OK, and what we see here is that well, we seem to learn the same thing independently of the um, initialization, at least for the first maybe five layers and the, the last two or last three seem to be a little bit more different here. But that gives us a reference point. Um, and then we can compare what, what happens if I train a network on random labels. So now I'm comparing a network that was trained on the correct labels with a network that was trained on the random labels. And now there is no similarity at all. So that's different from what we were seeing uh, on the spatial filters. Here in the channel weights, it seems that, which is perhaps not very surprising, they're using very different strategies. Um, even though both networks have a very low train accuracy right, on their respective labels. Um, but what's very interesting is I can also compare different random labels together. So this third row are networks trained on the same set of random labels but varying the random initialization. And the fourth row are networks where I change the random labels themselves. So I, I have a different set of random labels. And what's extremely surprising to me is that these two rows are essentially the same. So it's as if the particular random labels that you have don't influence at all the kind of things that you're learning. Or at least it, it all, all the viability comes in random initialization, but not really from the random labels. Yes? Uh, how would the plot look like at initialization? Ah, that's a very good question. Uh, so at initialization, you have um, weights are drawn from um, uh, Gaussian weight distribution, so all the eigenvectors are rotationally invariant, so there would be absolutely no uh, similarity. Okay, yeah. yeah. Can you just make sure that I understood the last uh, row correctly? So you have the same input, two different sets of random labels. Yes. And then you start from the same initial conditions. No, I also varied the, ran the, the random initialization here. So the third row is just random initialization. The fourth row is random initialization plus random labels. So the, the yeah, that's, that's puzzling, right? It seems that essentially there are two strategies. There is a 
generalizing strategy and memorizing one for the random labels, but this memorizing doesn't depend on the actual random labels. Well, I mean, there's no similarity for the last layers, right? Uh, so the, the labels have to be encoded somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but for the part where things don't depend on a random initialization for the first five or six layers, uh, it's the same. Okay, so I think this calls for, for explanation. If someone has an idea, I'm very interested uh, what this means. Yes? Uh, no, I'm using cross entropy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, this is just like standard training. Uh, yes. Um, I think I disable weight decay, uh, just because it, when you want to look at the weights, it's sim it's simpler because like now you have the initialization at reference points instead of having things going down. But I wouldn't imagine this changing the results really much. But that. Yeah, that could be checked. Yes? So I have, like, I have like three different things. I have the true labels, okay, the correct ones that come from ImageNet. I have one set of random labels, random labels A, and I have another set of random labels, random labels B. So what's the difference A and B? A and B, they're, well, if, if you give me one image, they're going to be different. They're both independent, uniform labels. Okay. That's what I wanted to like. Yeah. You just draw again. Yeah, you just draw like, again. Like yes. Same that's like yes, yes. So so it when there is noise, it only depends on the distribution. It seems like it only depends on the distribution of the noise, so like the noise level and not really the realization of the noise. Okay, and we can also do this to compare networks trained across data sets. So here you have four pairs of data sets, like the first row is CIFAR ten against CIFAR five. It's just a first five classes of CIFAR. Um, and an interesting thing to note is that these dimensionalities, they depend on the complexity of the tasks. If I have data sets with more classes, the networks typically learn more relevant, like there are more eigenvalues that are going to separate from the Martian copas to bulk. And we need more dimensions to capture the performance of these networks. So we see these arrows being larger and larger. Um, and we see a lot of similarity for most for most of these comparisons, so for instance, the third row, ImageNet 100A, ImageNet 100B, I took ImageNet and I took two non-overlapping subsets of 100 classes. Okay, and I'm comparing if, like, am I learning the same things here or not? Uh, and for the first, maybe six layers, the answer is yes. Or maybe not so surprising, for the first layer, we're learning edge detectors, whatever the classes are. But now we're very, very deep in the network and there's still, there's still similarity, so. It seems that there's some universality. Some things don't really depend on the classes. It's only in the last two layers that we see the, the similarity dropping. Yeah. Um, like, what's your, like, you always have to identify the rotation, basically. Yes. Like, how well does that work in these cases? Ah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, when, we can't, when we can't align things, then we can't see any similarity. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't have a measure here. Um, well, what's we, what for sure is that when we, when we find similarity, that means we probably were able to find uh, rotation. Uh, but the thing is, when we can't find a rotation for the activations, that I don't even know what it means for the layers to have learned the same thing. What does it mean for two, uh, two neurons to do the same thing if the inputs are not the same? Um, uh, but there, there's, um, there's been prior work that has shown that like, there is, there's a lot of similarity in this representation. So this, paper by Conblith and Hinton, um, where they do, this, they do this kind of things. And like, that, was, that was a motivation for what we were doing, is there was this empirical um, observation that you can always find rotations to align representations of networks, even sometimes trained on different data sets. I'm sorry, what, what do you mean? I don't yeah. Yeah, that's maybe because the representations now become different uh, because, yeah, you have non-overlapping sets of classes. So, yeah, I, yeah, this is this is uh, still thinking on how exactly to present these results together, with the, how to interpret um, the quality of the rotation that we find so to see if like this lack of similarity comes from the lack of alignment or something else. Yes. Do you know in many cases there is a linearity for the 
Uh, this is this is value. Sorry? Value. Oh, it's value. I've I've done this with networks that have uh, absolute value and nonlinearity, or even like complex network that had complex modulus and it worked as, as well. I didn't try other things. Okay, um, so we've been comparing covariances, uh, and you can wonder whether this is all there is, right? There are also higher order moments. Um, can we really say that like, they have learned the same thing? It's just like we find similarity in some covariances. Um, now I've said I want to connect this back to performance. Um, so here is a model where we can check what kind of information is embedded in the covariances. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I train a reference network I'm going to compute the covariances of the weights at all layers. And I'm going to use this to generate a new random set of weights from Gaussian distributions with the same covariances. And then I'm just going to evaluate the performance. That's the way to check. Like if I take all the covariances at all the layers, what, are, what information is in there? So how this works for the, we, we call this a rainbow network. Uh, for the first layer, I just take the covariance and I sample from the Gaussian distribution. Uh, but for the second layer, I'm not going to, to use the covariance directly because remember that the axes are different for the second layer. So again, I'm going to compute the activations from my train reference network and the rainbow network. I'm going to align them. And then I can use this alignment to sort of calculate what is the correct covariance to use for the second layer. And then I can sample from it. Okay, so this is a Gaussian model, but the layers are not independent. Right now, the second layer is dependent on the first layer because of this alignment that depends on the weights for the first layer, okay? So this is very important. If you try to do things independently, it's not going to work. And here what we get here, this is on CIFR 10, I'm measuring performance as a function of the width because this is a model that works, with, works well in the infinite width limit. That's when the law of large numbers start to kick in and then we can find this alignment. So in blue, it's the performance of the train network that's very stable across width, okay? It goes up to 92%. And the red dashed line is this rainbow construction where there's absolutely no training. Uh, we get up to 85 and we recover most of what we lost if we just retrain the classifier. Okay, so at small width, this model is terrible. It doesn't work at all because you, probably you can't align uh, the networks. But if the width is large enough, there's, in some cases, almost all of the information is independent in these covariances. Okay, so really the rest, we can, we can treat it as noise. So what's the picture that comes out of this? What does each layer, yes? Isn't this kind of like kind of intuition why like the mean field analysis works? That like if you have like large width then you're then the only thing that is important is the distribution of That's that's you're right, that's exactly mean field. Uh, but mean field is mostly for one hidden layer networks, and it's not clear how you think about the distribution for the second layer. What we do here, like the our answer to this question is the distribution of the second layer needs to be sort of realigned to the first layer, right? This, this rotation that you have to take into account. And then once you take care of this rotation, then it's just a sequence of distributions. And this is just multi-layer mean field, yeah. Okay, so when, when we look at these, these layers, um, what, what are they doing? Um, they're computing random features in this model, like even Gaussian features but with a weight covariance that's low rank. So we can factorize this operation in, in two steps. There's first a redu reduction in dimensionality because all my neurons are in a lower dimensional subspace. Um, and then there's an expansion in dimensionality because I have many neurons in that low dimensional subspace. And then I take a nonlinearity. So I have an expansion in random features. Okay, and it's, they're, they're, the random features are not white. They're colored by the covariance. This is. Uh, as we call white noise or colored noise in signal processing. So this is why we call this the rainbow model. And so we see that the network is doing this cascade of reductions in expansions. Um, I, I like to think of it as if the network is zooming on the interesting part, right? You, you have something that you find interesting and then you get rid of the rest and then you blow it up and then you do it again. And each layer we're zooming on this interesting uh, subspace that's given by the covariance. Of course, the question is can we understand what this subspace is? Uh, so let me conclude. What are the relevant concepts to think about train networks? 
I think the, the things that emerge are kernels and weight statistics, so like think mean field distributions, except that you have to take this rotation into account. Um, and I think these are the two, the two, the two important things to, to study. So these are really global measures, right? Not, not individual neurons. Um, I think we can think of features as is weight principal directions. And I've shown how we can measure the dimensionality and the similarity across networks and also link them to performance with this Gaussian model. That's a bit simplistic, but that works, that works in some cases, not, not all. Um, and now what, what are we doing when we're comparing networks? We're really comparing data sets. Okay, the, the, the training sort of extracts statistics from the training set and then encodes them in the weights and we're able to just compare these different statistics. So when we see this universality of some weight statistics, it's really about universality of statistics from data sets of natural images. We can even think of natural images as some universality class where you would learn the same thing, whatever the, the class is, whatever the task. Um, and what's interesting, I think, is that um, in some preliminary experiments, we have seen that when you change the architecture, sometimes you see more similarity or less similarity between networks trained on different data sets. So that means that universality can be used as a guiding principle if what you want to build is a foundation model. Perhaps you don't really care so much on performance on different tasks, but I'd be much more satisfied if you could show me that what you've learned is sort of universal and it's the same on different data sets. Um, and the last thing is that this tool we can also apply during training, uh, which is a very interesting direction. We can measure dimensionalities and similarities during training. We can see also are things learned in the same order and uh, like what's, what's happening, what's the, um, what, yeah, what's happening during training. Okay, I'm going to stop here. If you want resources, if you want to read uh, about it, there's two papers, one that goes in the mathematical model with like infinite width convergence and that kind of things, and there's a more uh, summary paper where we, saw we do this universality. Uh, everything is in here, and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Florentin. There has been already many questions, but I expect more. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Florentin. Really nice work, really nice talk. Um, we've asked you quite a lot of detailed questions, right? So maybe if, if I think back to your last picture with the, with the rainbow, no? Like, um, this one? Yeah, exactly. So, and what you're proposing here is, 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 is quite interesting, no? Because there's a lot of uh, discussion about how, you know, neural networks in the first half of the network basically do something like an expansion of the dimensionality, you know? They blow it up, blow it up, and, yeah. and then they, the dimensionality of the representation goes down, and, and you, you, you zoom in on the features that are really important for your classification task, right? What you're proposing here is very different, no? Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, so there are many, many notions of dimensionality, and there's many things you can measure. Uh, first, you can talk about the dimensionality of activations or the dimensionality of the weights. I think most works that look at dimensionality in networks usually look at the activations. Um, but at least from a second order perspective, all the activations have the same dimensionality because the spectrum is always one over k at all layers. So it seems like, that's why I'm, I'm like, here I put the same dimensionality in all the, in all the middle is because these random nonlinear features, they sort of expand the dimensionality as much as, as they can and you get to that critical one over k behavior. Um, but when you look at the weights, you have a different story. Uh, so the, these bottlenecks here have different dimensionalities. Uh, they typically increase with dimensionality, with uh, depth. However, there is something to keep in mind is that we have convolutional layers and here we're measuring dimensionality of essentially the channel uh, part of the weights. Um, and like, because they're convolutional layers, the receptive field of a given neuron increases with depth, right? So essentially this first layer encodes, looks at only small patches in the image, and as you go deeper in the network, they encode larger patches. So it seems natural that the, dimension, the dimensionality they will use to encode larger patches will also increase. So yeah, that, I don't know if that answers your question. That's what I can say about dimensionality. It's more food for thought. <laughs> it's very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about the similarity measures that are uh, already existing, like CCA or CKA? So all of these are on the activations. The one that we're using here, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's the Procrustes distance, um, also called shape metric in the literature. Um, it seems to be, to me, 
the natural one because it has this geometric interpretation of finding the best rotation, whereas CKA, CCA are, so the CKA is about comparing the kernels themselves, but then it's, it's not the right metrics for the activation. Um, and CCA is something that's invariant to linear reparameterizations, which seems at first felt like a good property, but I think it's actually misleading because the training dynamics are not invariant to, um, to like um, linear reparameterizations, right? So geometry is very important. So I think the, that's why, I, again, I say, and this, this is a point that was very nicely made by this paper by uh, Cornbrith and, and Hinton and someone else, I don't remember, uh, that the right symmetric group are rotations, not linear invariances. Uh, and yeah, the second thing I should say is that when we compare activations, we only get part of the story, and if we can compare the weights, that's sort of a more fundamental thing. Uh, what we see here is that when we have the same weight statistics, there's a theorem that tells you that you have the same representations up to activation. So this is sort of a more fundamental comparison. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Um, I, I wanted to ask, how does this depend on the initialization of the weights? Like whether you initialize it with standard scaling or whether you initialize it with... Very, very good question. Uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, the only thing I can say is that I used, I used to think that for some reason we were initializing weights with Gaussian distribution. It turns out the default in PyTorch is actually uniform, uh, but that turns out to not matter. Uh, very quickly the marginals become Gaussian and as we know there is probably universality that like, if you initialize all the entries from IID distribution only the second moment matters. But your question was about the scale and that, yeah, I don't know, that's something that's be interesting to explore. Hi, Florentin. Hey. So I was like, the question is about this uh, covariance view on the distributions and stuff. So like, you know, people are excited about like looking at individual neurons because they think they can correct biases and uh, mm -hmm. like interpret neural networks and so on. When you look at core R's quantities like covariances, do you think like you can interpret like, or you can edit like structures or are, are you missing something with this mu or you think you're like capturing? Mm. So yeah, I think there's, there is a, uh, yeah, different parts to, to this answer. Um, the, like, the equivalent of trying to in interpret individual neurons in this picture that I've been presenting would be trying to interpret individual eigenvectors, right? Try to uh, ascribe semantic meaning to these directions. I don't really know if that's possible. Um, and yeah, another thing I can say is that it, uh, if, if we, uh, subscribe to this mean field view and there's some distribution. Um, it's like, do we really believe that individual neurons are going to be meaningful or not? And I think it depends really on the distribution that you have. If you have a distribution that's like Gaussian mixture with clusters, perhaps each of the cluster is interpretable and we would indeed find them in, in different networks and we can act on them. If, if we have a Gaussian distribution, which is on the other extreme, everything is a mix of everything else. Um, and so if you find inter readable neurons, it seems more like a statistical coincidence that, that like, do we really believe that every realization from a Gaussian distribution, we could give a word to describe its meaning? Um, but if the network is doing a sampling from Gaussian distribution. Yeah, if, if, if we ascribe to that. And then we know that like Gaussian distributions are not all there is. For instance, because of neural collapse, we know that the weights in the last layers of the network tend to cluster around the different classes. Um, so I think it all depends on like how, what's, what's the shape of that distribution? Does it have clusters or is it more of a maximum entropy kind of, kind of thing? Thank you. Next question. Um, super interesting topic. Um, like, did you, like in the end you um, mentioned like uh, foundation models and so on. And I, I mean, I really see uh, like where you're coming from. My question is now, um, did you try something like this? Like, did you try like uh, fine tuning this kind uh, of model? No, no, this is just something that I, like we noticed uh, during the okay. last uh, steps of this work and like I thought this would be interesting. Uh, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried at all. Like I don't even, yeah, that's just an observation. I don't even know why some networks would be more, like seem to learn more similar things than others. Okay, okay. 
Thanks. Last question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for a very nice presentation. Um, a couple of slides back, um, I think you were talking about uh, measuring the similarity when you change the um, labels to random labels, for example. Yeah. And um, in my intuition, in depth, when you have like the input signal coming from the input side, it kind of decreases a little bit yes. uh, over depth. And then when you have the labels, uh, it decreases uh, in the other direction because you're constantly multiplying with the weights, let's yes. say, for the gradients as well. So it seems like there's like two uh, conflicting uh, signals that are um, mixing up. And I was wondering if you, uh, so this is, I guess, a quite deep network. Um, uh, this, this is basically all there is. There are eight layers. Ah, okay. Uh, I, yeah, I, VGG has an MLP classifier, but to simplify, I even replaced it with a linear classifier. So this is, this is all there is. There's just, okay. just the classifier I'm not showing. But. Okay. And did you uh, see a difference if you make, made it even like, um, like deeper or uh, even shallower that, the, that this is, has less similarity? Yeah, very, very good question. Uh, I don't know. I, like the depth is something that I'd like to explore more. What is the role of, of the depth and what, what happens when we have uh, deeper, deeper networks? Because I think we can use this tool to sort of understand, like, is it really the case that if I double the number of layers, then the job of a layer now is done by two layers or like how, how these okay. things happen? I don't really know. Um, and given the, 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 the signal propagation interpretation that you gave, I also <laughs> think of it in this way. Uh, and here we sort of, we can think of as measuring how much, like what's the depth, um, to w which depth does X and Y propagate in the network. Though there are some caveats because um, even the first layer moves much more slowly, it takes much more time to train uh, when you have random labels than when you have true labels. So that means that something hmm. still probably propagates yeah. to the first layer. Okay, uh, so you do see a difference even in the first layer there. Uh, in the yeah, in the, in the trajectories. Uh, mm -hmm. For the spatial filters, even though we, we learned the same, uh, we learned the same spatial filters, the trajectories are not the same. Okay, uh, thank you. So. Okay, let's thank uh, Florentin again. <laughs> and so we are a bit late. Do we resume at... Uh... Okay. 11. Yes. Of course. Because I was there, I don't like working in this vision area. Okay. So, like, why? I like it. I really didn't get the point. Like, really, why do you think like rotation is sufficient to map? Um. Because the, all the inner products are the same. So when you have, if you have two point clouds and you know that the